Good afternoon and welcome to today's Global Fleet Champions webinar. In case you haven't heard of us before, Global Fleet Champions is a partnership campaign administered by Break, the road safety charity, to prevent deaths, injuries and pollution caused by vehicles driven for work. To learn more about the campaign and what we do, visit globalfleetchampions.org. Today's webinar focuses on planning journeys to share the road. Our presenters today will discuss how to prepare drivers to share the road with large vehicles, advice for planning journeys to protect vulnerable road users, and we have a case study of a scheme to teach drivers to better understand the challenges faced by vulnerable road users. In a minute, you should see a multiple choice poll question appear on your screen that will ask you a question to find out about your experience with this subject. It is anonymous. Simply fill in your answer and press confirm, and we will discuss the results at the beginning of the Q&A session, which is your opportunity to put your questions to today's speakers. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by using the chat box on Microsoft Teams. A question will appear on your screen shortly. You'll have approximately a minute to fill it in and the webinar will then begin. Thank you. Greetings, my name is Scott Tidwell. I'm a senior field researcher at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute's Division of Freight, Transit and Heavy Vehicle Safety. We do a lot of research with heavy vehicles. We look at driver distraction, driver fatigue, new safety technologies to help reduce crashes with these vehicles. And we're also working with automated driving systems within the heavy vehicle world. However, we also do community outreach. I'm here today to talk about sharing the road with trucks and why that's important to the general driving public around the world. So first, I would like you to think about some inherent risks of driving. It's actually one of the most dangerous tasks that the average person does on an everyday basis. And in fact, globally, we see there are over 1.3 million fatalities with vehicle crashes every year. But worse yet, vehicle crashes and fatalities are the leading cause of death for young people ages five to 29 around the world. And we see that in lower income countries, there are a disproportionate number of vehicle fatalities. And that's actually about triple the rate of higher income countries. So that's a big issue. So you, let's talk about some large trucks and lorries. Kind of as an example, here in the United States, there are approximately 13.4 million registered large trucks. And those large trucks haul about 72.5% of all freight and commodities in this country. And in 2020, there were just over 439,000 of those trucks involved in police reported crashes. So that's an awful lot. And then just under 5,000 people died and almost 147,000 people were seriously injured. When we look in Europe, in 2020, there were approximately 6.2 million large trucks and lorries on those roadways. They hauled just over 73% of all freight and commodities. And when we look at the data in 2015, approximately 45,000 crashes involved one of those large trucks and lorries. So again, a lot of trucks, a lot of crashes based on that number of trucks and lorries out there. You might be wondering, well, why does this matter to you or, or to the general driving public? Well, these larger vehicles have more severe consequences. Passenger vehicle occupants, other road users such as motorcyclists, bicyclists, pedestrians, scooter riders, they're more likely to die when there's a crash involving a large truck or lorry. And in fact, in our research, we saw in 2016 that 97% of all fatalities in crashes involving a large truck and a passenger vehicle were occupants of the passenger vehicle. So it's typically not the truck driver or the lorry driver that dies in these crashes. And when we look at some data even more and some police reports, we found that passenger vehicle drivers are usually the ones at fault, especially here in the United States. But that assumption could probably hold true around the world. And what we saw here in the US is that 78% of crashes are near crashes between a large truck and a passenger vehicle and driving the passenger vehicle. It's usually not that truck driver or that lorry driver's fault. And just keep in mind, when there's a crash between these vehicle types, that's a battle that the passenger vehicle is never going to win. So how big are these heavy vehicles? Well, regulations vary greatly from country to country, but they're typically based on axle weight limits and axle spacing. And as an example, 
One of the most commonly set up rigs is a five axle articulated truck or lorry. Here in the United States, they can weigh up to 36.3 metric tons. They can actually weigh up to 55 metric tons in Mexico, Canada, and Australia. In the European Union, they're typically can weigh up to between 40 to 50 metric tons, depending on which country they're traveling in. And on countries within the Asian highway network, they typically can weigh up to between 34 and a half to almost 51 metric tons. And finally in China, they can weigh up to 43 metric tons. So while those weight limits vary, you can see how heavy they are compared to smaller passenger vehicles. Straight trucks and rigid trucks also have weight limits, although much lower than the articulated trucks. And what we see is because these large trucks and lorries are so heavy, they require much longer stopping distances. And at approximately 89 kilometers per hour, it can take an articulated truck or lorry the length of an American football field, so 110 meters to come to a complete stop. And that's in good weather. If it's raining or snowing, it can double that and take up to 220 meters for one of these rigs to come to a complete stop. And you always wanna be aware, you know, people have the misconception that drivers of large trucks or lorries because they sit higher off the ground have much better visibility, but that's not the case. Drivers of passenger vehicles will have much better visibility than a truck or lorry driver. And passenger vehicles always wanna watch their surroundings. Observe the turn signals of these large trucks. You know, they may have to straddle lanes. They may have to start moving in the opposite direction than they intend to turn because they are so big and they need so much space out on the roads. So you might be wondering, well, how can the general public safely drive around these large trucks and lorries? Well, there are five key strategies. Don't hang out in the no zones, properly passing trucks, don't, get, don't cut it short, don't get squeezed and maintain a safe following distance. So strategy one, don't hang out in the no zones. These yellow shaded areas represent the no zones or blind spots around a large truck or lorry. The image on top is representative if you drive on the right side of the road in your country. The bottom image is representative if you drive on the left side of the road in your country. But as we can see, the rear no zone can extend for up to 200 feet behind the trailer, and that's where the driver may not be able to see. We have the passenger side no zone, which can extend three lanes wide and is the largest and most dangerous of the no zones. We have the driver's side no zone goes from about the driver's door back along the front part of that trailer. And then we have the front no zone. And now I realize that can vary here in the United States and Australia. They have conventional style tractors with the long hood out in front. That is, those no zones can extend for up to 20 feet where that driver may not be able to see. I know in, in Europe, Asia, some other countries, they primarily drive cab over configuration trucks. That really minimizes that front no zone and helps out a lot. So you might only have about a foot or so that you wouldn't be able to see directly in front of that truck. Strategy two, properly passing trucks. You want to pass on the driver's side of that truck. That is the smallest no zone or blind spot that that passenger vehicle can move through. The passenger vehicle needs to move steadily by the truck or lorry and not linger next to it. If they linger, that driver of the lorry or the truck may check their mirrors, not see that passenger vehicle, go to change lanes and can run that passenger vehicle off the road. The passenger vehicle needs to use their turn signal well in advance and then make sure it's used again before moving back over in front. And finally, there's a good rule of thumb. You wanna look for the entire front of that truck or lorry from the ground to the top before you move back over in front. That way you're far enough down the road to safely do so. Strategy three, don't cut it short. You don't ever wanna pull directly in front of a truck or a lorry. You know, remember how heavy they are? They're not gonna be able to stop in time to avoid rear ending you, or even worse, running right over the top of your car. So always remember to use that rule of thumb. Look for the entire front of that truck or lorry in your rear view mirror before you move over. Strategy four, don't get squeezed. You know, these trucks need a lot of room to make these turns. They make wide turns. There's various configurations all around the world of trailer length, the number of trailers. Here in the United States, the most common configuration is a 53 foot trailer 
coupled to the tractor, which gives a total length of about 70 feet. But any trailer length or configuration needs a lot of space. What we commonly see when they put their turn signal on in straddle lanes or even start moving in the opposite direction they intend to turn, a passenger vehicle becomes impatient and tries to squeeze past them. Well, in those situations, for the truck, limited vision. Good example in truck that pushed or run off the road. When it comes to intersections, you want to make sure you stay behind that stop line, that white line painted on the on the road. Or if that's not there, you want to make sure you stay far enough back. So when a trucker lorry is turning, they have enough space to safely maneuver around you and not stop and block traffic until you back up or hit the front of your car. And finally, if you ever see one backing, remember they don't have rear view mirrors. So they can't, that driver cannot look up and see directly behind them like you can in a passenger vehicle. So if a trucker lorry is backing and you're in a passenger vehicle, you wanna stop, be patient, wait for them to finish backing, then you can proceed on down the road. And finally, strategy five, you wanna maintain a safe following distance. Following too closely is like a brick wall in front of you. You can't see through it, you can't see around it. There may be debris in the roadway coming up that you can't avoid. Maybe there's a construction zone, an emergency vehicle on the side of the road that you need to move over for, and you won't be able to see it in time to do so. Also, if you're too close, cargo may shift and fall off the back of the truck, and you won't be able to avoid it. This top image here is a good example of what can happen. This car was tailgating a truck. That metal ramp came flying off the back right through the windshield of that car. Imagine if that ramp was about a half meter over what that would have done to the driver. Also, if you're too close and a truck or lorry locks their brakes up and you don't react in time, you're gonna rear end them. When it comes to a, a truck, quite often that resu results in an underride crash. And the bottom of these trailers are typically about head height to where you sit in the driver's seat of a passenger vehicle. This bottom image here is a good example of what can happen. You don't wanna be in that situation. So there's a good rule of thumb. Can you see their mirrors? At highway speeds, you wanna be far enough back to where you can see the mirrors on both sides of that vehicle. That way you know you are out of that rear nose zone. When it comes to city driving, stop and go traffic, obviously you're gonna be a lot closer. You wanna position yourself so you can at least see the driver's side mirror. That way you know the driver can see you as well. So just to review, don't hang out in the four no zones, pass safely on the driver's side, don't linger, always use your turn signal. Don't cut trucks or lorries off. Use the rule of thumb. Look for the entire front of that truck or lorry in your rearview mirror before you move back over. Don't get squeezed. Never try to pass a turning truck. Be patient. Observe their turn signals and maintain safe following distances. Don't tailgate. Stay far enough back to where you can see the mirrors of that truck. So thank you for watching this presentation. I will be there on the live session. If you have any other questions, feel free to email sharing the road at vtti.vt.edu or my email that's located in the bottom right. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, today, I want to share my thoughts from a journey management perspective about how we go about protecting vulnerable road users. Now, we'll start off looking at some of the facts and figures uh, behind uh, vulnerable road users. Uh, we'll then look about uh, uh, things about journey planning, management, um, the use of technology, uh, and then look at the bigger picture about where this fits into the risk management program and how this dovetails into operating practices and procedures within a business. But the first thing I want to sort of ask you is, is, is what are you doing to, to measure collisions involving vulnerable road users? Now, it's common to find people measuring overall collisions, either from their management uh, company's data or insurance providers' data. Um, some people look at uh, lost time injuries for their employees, but how many of you are measuring collisions where a vulnerable road user is injured? And if you're not doing that, then, then perhaps you should be doing so that you can get some insight about where the issues are within your business. What are the issues? Um, well, the figures along the bottom show different modes of transport and the percentage of people who are killed in road collisions every year. 
and we can see that um, for motorcyclists, cyclists and pedestrians, the vulnerable road users, they make up over, over 50 percent of, of the fatalities. Now, this is data from the UK, but it would be broadly similar in all other countries around the world. Um, vulnerable road users are are vulnerable. Um, they haven't got uh, the bits of metal protecting them that car drivers, van drivers, lorry drivers, coach and bus drivers have. They generally haven't got the um, passive safety equipment apart from some motorcyclists. Um, so they're more at risk. And this is uh, highlighted and then uh, this is specific to the UK. If we look at the fatality rate um, amongst these road users, Car drivers, 44% of car drivers um, make up the fatality statistics in the UK, but it's a very low percentage of people who are involved in collisions compared to how far they drive. And as you can see from the data, the vulnerable road users are much more uh, at risk. Now, if we look at where the collisions are occurring, well, well again, this is um, the UK and we, we're looking at motorways, urban roads and rural roads. You can see that um, you can see the percentages of, 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 of where the traffic is. Now, if we look at overall casualties, we can see that motorways are far safer. Well, one of the reasons being is there are no pedestrians or no cyclists, or at least there shouldn't be. Um, more people are being injured on urban roads, and perhaps that's understandable because of the, you know, the, all the vulnerable road users who are using those urban roads and less so on rural, rural roads. But then if we look at fatalities, the, the figures are, uh, are reversed. Again, motorways are, are far, far safer. Uh, less people are being killed on urban roads, probably because of lower average speeds, more so on rural roads. Uh, and my executive summary of this is that if you're going to injure yourself as a car or a van or a lorry driver, it's probably going to be outside an urban area. If you're going to kill or injure somebody else, a vulnerable road user, it's likely to be in an urban area. So knowing where the collisions occur, what can we do about it? What can we have in our policies and procedures that's got either ideally going to eliminate or, or more practically going to reduce the chances of us being in conflict with these uh, other, other vulnerable road users? Um, and the first thing is, is, can we set a route, can we set a schedule so that we're avoiding uh, vulnerable road users? And especially when we know that there are going to be a lot of them around. So the rush hours would be a prime example. And also, uh, especially when we're talking about children, it's the morning and the afternoon school runs. We know that there's going to be a lot of uh, children and parents walking and cycling to and from school around these times. So can we do anything to avoid those areas at those times? Now, every organisation is different and you're all going to have different needs. You're all going to have different challenges. Even within, a, within an organisation, you might have um, van drivers doing something, car drivers doing something else, truck drivers doing something else. But it's important to have that th those thoughts. Now, a great example is, is with me locally. They're building a retirement complex which is in an urban area. And there's two routes to get to that retirement complex. There's the short route from the motorway and there's the longer route. And there's lots of signage gone up saying to, to, to construction traffic, don't use the short route. There's clear signage at the end exit to the um, to the site. Go this way, construction traffic. And on first sight, this seemed a bit strange because there was two quite challenging off camber mini roundabouts um, to, to negotiate and there was a narrow railway bridge to cross. But when you looked at it in more depth, clearly somebody had done a risk assessment because throughout that route, there were cycle paths off, off the highway if cyclists chose to, to use them. There were lots of pedestrian controlled traffic lights um, that near, near, the, near the school on that route. Um, uh, and there were no shops or, or houses um, that exited onto, the, onto that route. So from a minimizing the conflict with vulnerable road users, that was a sensible choice, even though it's probably more challenging for the for the for the drivers themselves. So if you set routes for people, if you plan schedules, then what can you do within your organization to minimize the time that that uh, to, the drivers are going to be where we know lots of vulnerable road users are going to be? And again, going back to my earlier point, that will depend on exactly what, what you're doing. But uh, as another example, you know, if you've got engineers visiting visiting customer sites, can some of those be in rural areas at uh, rush hours and, and school picking up times and in urban areas at other times? There's lots of things to consider. 
The other thing when we're talking about route planning and scheduling is is minimizing the chance of the driver getting stressed. So are we allowing enough time for the driver to get from A to B or A to B to C or whatever you're doing? Um, are we taking into account congestion? Are we taking into account the times that they're traveling? Are we taking into account road works? Are we taking into account the need to take regular breaks on longer journeys? Because if the driver's stressed, then they're going to take more risk. They're probably going to be driving too fast. They're going to pro probably be driving too close. Um, they may be on their phone to, to, to ring the person that they're visiting that they're going to be late. All of these things are increasing the risk that they're going to be involved in a collision. And what we don't want is them doing that in urban areas where there's lots of vulnerable road users. Now, there's two considerations to think about here. If you're planning or scheduling the route for your drivers, then whoever's planning those routes or setting those schedules, they need to have awareness of this issue and they need to be on board with actually trying to minimise the times. If you've got a population of employees who set their own schedules and plan their own routes, then they are going to need some training about what the risks are and, and how to plan a schedule and, and, and plan a route because uh, I've been involved in many organisations, for example, uh, with, with salespeople, and they're just given given their, their keys to their car, they're giving a list of customer names and they're given a list of prospects and told to get on with it. And so don't assume that people know how to plan and schedule sensibly. Moving on to collision avoidance technologies, there's a lot of um, technology now that will detect pedestrians and cyclists and apply the brakes if the driver hasn't reacted. Um, now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this, but it's available for cars, it's increasingly available for vans, but it's a backstop. It doesn't uh, stop the driver having full responsibility for their, their own actions, for spotting those pedestrians, for spotting those cyclists, for be to be traveling at an appropriate speed where there's vulnerable road users around. This is a backstop in case, for whatever reason, the driver fails to stop, fails to spot the, uh, the vulnerable road user. Um, but you know, if you can uh, specify this technology on your vehicles, then do so. Probably the most important slide that we'll cover today is this one. Um, in, in the middle, we've got the work related road risk management program, and you can see there's lots of different elements to that. We've been talking about policies and procedures from a journey planning perspective, but there's all these other things that need to take place to have an effective program that's going to sustainably um, reduce the collision and claim rate within your organization. But the thing is, I want to talk to today about the two outer circles, management and culture. When I talk about management, yes, it's important that managers are, are on board, they're supportive of, of the um, of the programme, but really I'm, I want to talk about the operational needs of the business. Um, because if you've got some good safety policies and procedures, and I, and I come across many organisations who've got great safety policies and procedures, but if these are in conflict with the operating practices and procedures of the business, then the safety policy isn't enforceable. The driver can't drive to that policy because nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100 probably, they're going to make decisions based on the operating needs of the business uh, to achieve their business metric rather than the safe driving needs of the business. So uh, often when I'm working with organisations, that my recommendations are, well, actually, you need to change your operating practices and procedures to create an environment in which employees can drive safely. And then management has a, an equally important role to start developing that on-road safety culture so that drivers want to drive safely. Now, I can't stress this, 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 this enough. It's not enough to have good safety policies and procedures. You need to, they need to be aligned with the management operating practices and procedures within your organisation. To sum up, we, we know vulnerable road users are, are most at risk. They haven't got that, those bits of metal around them. They haven't got that passive... Uh, safety equipment in general, um, they're inherently more at risk. They make up 50% of the fatality um, statistics, at least 50% in every country around the world. We know where um, the, they're more likely to, to, to be at risk, and that's on the urban, air, urban areas, especially around uh, busy times, such as school picking up and dropping off times. So in our, in our journey planning, planning and management, we need to try and minimize the time that our employees are sharing the road with those vulnerable road users in those areas at those times. But most importantly is getting the management right um, based on your risk appetite, creating a risk environment in which employees can drive safely. 
um, changing the operating practices and procedures so that they're aligned with the needs of your safe driving policies and procedures so that drivers don't have to be in those urban areas uh, when there's going to be lots of vulnerable road users around um, and then developing the safety culture so that the driver doesn't drive safely because they have to but because they want to thank you very much for your attention Hello, my name is Julie Smith. I'm an active travel officer at Transport for Greater Manchester, and I'm going to talk to you today about safe urban driver training. I work for Transport for Greater Manchester, which is a public body that is responsible for coordinating transport services throughout Greater Manchester in um, Northwest England. Um, covers such things as Metrolink, the trams, buses, cycling, and what is called the B network, which is um, an, a network of cycle ways that we're connecting together to create one big network across Greater Manchester. And I'm an active travel officer, so it's my role to encourage people to walk and cycle and use active means of travel in Greater Manchester. And one of the projects I'm working on is a safe urban driver training project. So first of all, if I start talking about why we have this project, there was some research done looking at collisions between bicycles and goods vehicles uh, from January 2015 to July 2020. And the analysis showed that 75% of fatalities within the study occur in collisions with um, vehicles that are uh, heavier than 7.5 tonnes. And also a large number of collisions involve goods vehicles that are less than 3.5 tonnes. There were less collisions involving buses or coaches and few collisions involving 3.5 and 7.5 ton good vehicles or minibuses. So looking at this information, we decided to maybe do a project to try and train local people who drive good vehicles to consider how they drive in, in in conjunction with vulnerable road users. And so what happened was we put a tender out for a training program to be run in the Greater Manchester area. So this training was commissioned and paid for through Safer Roads Greater Manchester partnership. A tender was put out and the National Cycling Academy won the tender um, in partnership with En Route Training. NCA, the National Cycling Academy, runs several other courses for us, like, for example, ride leader training and some bike maintenance training. And they're based in Manchester um, and have training facilities um, in central Manchester. And they, in, in partnership with En Route, who supply the tutors, have put together the Safe Urban Driver training course um, to be run in the Manchester area. So what are the aims of the Safe Urban Driver course? First of all, it's to define who vulnerable road users are and to raise awareness of them. So I suppose you could define a vulnerable road user as, as somebody who maybe is pedestrian, who's a cyclist, maybe a wheelchair user, maybe in a pram. You know, there's all kinds of vulnerable road users, but there tend to be people, you know, people who, you know, if they come into contact with a vehicle will be seriously injured, at least seriously injured or, or killed. And the aim is to reduce the risk for vulnerable road users. Now, me as a person who's trying to encourage people to walk and cycle more, obviously one of the things they need to feel is safe in order to do this. Um, and so this is one element of that sort of active travel 
um, promotion is to make people feel safe. And so the aim of the Safe Uber Driver course is to help avoid accidents and to help drivers to assess emergency situations and make the right decisions in those. And it's also about the drivers themselves gaining practical experience of cycling on the roads. Other benefits of the course is that it provides um, credits towards the driver certificate of professional competence. In order to keep their license and to be driving commercially, drivers must do 35 hours of training every five years. And this course is a course that can count towards that training. So it's a useful course for drivers to do. It's to give them greater awareness of risks and reduce the chances of collisions. You know, that's that's the major point behind it. And it is heavily subsidised by Transport for Greater Manchester. Normally courses would be roughly £100 or more for each person to attend. And this course costs £10 for each person. So it's a, it's a huge discount um, and it's one of the things you know, that encourages people to book on the course. And so to talk about the course itself, this is a, a kind of rough overview as to what actually happens on the course. As I say, the course itself is takes place at the NCA in Manchester and the first half of it is in the classroom. So in the morning, it's basically you get together, have discussions about driving, um, you know, how to drive in certain areas, and it focuses on, on things such as the changing streetscape, because, for example, certainly in places like London and Greater Manchester, we are introducing more um, initiatives like um, low traffic neighbourhoods, so we are introducing more initiative like no, low traffic neighbourhoods. So where we've got um, a road that is causing residents problems because it's become a rat run, we have changed some of those roads. So they have bollards but to make it a, a kind of, you know, a road that is more usable for people who are walking and cycling and is no longer a rat run. So and also we're looking at identifying vulnerable road users, who they are, how they behave and thinking about sharing the road, you know, considering the road is is not just for cars and commercial vehicles. It is also for cyclists and for people crossing the road um, and for, and for all, all sorts of things like horses, etc. So it's about sharing the road. And it's also and also the course looks into safety equipment. So what does the you know the driver have in his cab and outside his cab that enables them to see what are they doing and and you know making people aware of the blind spots. So that's looking at the safety equipment that is available. The second part of the course is about cycling. So that is actually getting on a cycle, going out on the road and doing a bit of cycling in traffic. And this means it's about exchanging places. So the individuals will see the roads from a cyclist point of view and look at the problems that the cyclists might have when they're cycling along a road. So that might be, you know, it might be the potholes, it might be the gutters, it might be there's no cycle way to cycle on, uh, it might be parked cars, um, looking out for people opening their doors suddenly, all kinds of things that, that cyclists need to be aware of that maybe if you were, if you don't cycle you would not uh, have considered before. So this is all about exchanging places so that they can look at the hazards that maybe um, a cyclist might be considering when they're cycling on a road. And it's also an introduction to active travel for the, the um, attendees themselves because it gives them a chance to get out on a bike and, and do some um, 
you know, activity um, and it might sort of reintroduce them or introduce them to cycling again um, and make them consider that it might be something they might do um, to go to the shops or in their spare time. So, so an update on the course. So we started the courses in February 2022. And so far, we have delivered 20 courses and trained over 140 drivers. The cost for each individual to attend the course, as I said earlier, is £10. But that covers um, £8.75 to have the, you know, to be registered with the CPC as actually having attended the course. So all the paperwork, if you like, is already done for them as well. So that's another incentive to join the course. Um, and then it's just a, an additional admi administration charge to take it up to the £10. It's a day long course, as I've said, between classroom and practical session, and it has to be a seven hour course. It has to be a strict seven hour course. Um, and the, you know, when, when they're registered with a CPC, the trainer has to indicate that, that those, those um, people have attended a course of seven hours for it to be valid. And for the whole project, we are targeting between 30 and 40 courses. So that's between four and 12 people each course. And we will complete by the end of March 2023, if not before. We have been sending all our information out directly to local organisations and companies within the Greater Manchester area. So, for example, I've put together sort of lists of um, haulage companies and construction companies and all sorts of companies that might use commercial vehicles and we've approached them directly. We've also advertised in sort of fleet business press and we regularly post on, on social media to sort of update people as to how the project is going and encourage other people to sign up. Um, so it is, we've got bookings now for August and September um, and we, we will be doing more promotion within the September time to encourage people to sign up over the autumn. When it comes to course evaluation, everybody who attends the course will complete a survey on the actual day. Now this survey sort of focuses on their course experience, you know, was it good to get there, was, was the teacher good, did they get their point across, you know, generally how was the course, how did they feel about it. And also a few questions on maybe do they feel the course might have changed their attitude to vulnerable road users. Now we've co I'm collating all that information and the, the feedback so far is really good. People are very positive about the course and most people are coming back to say, yes, it's made them think about how cyclists behave and how pedestrians behave and to be more considerate towards them. But we'll be sending further surveys out to those that attended the course more than three months ago and we'll be asking for more information on those surveys. For example, you know, do they still feel that they, you know, they, their attitude and behaviour has changed towards cyclists and pedestrians? And also asking them for further information regarding any near misses they may have had, any incidents they've come across where they thought differently and the course has helped them to do that. So using those surveys, we'll be putting um, putting together a full evaluation report uh, to be written at the end of the project. OK, so that's um, basically um, a run through of the whole Safe Urban Driver project. Um, as I said at the beginning, my name is Julie Smith. I work for Transport for Greater Manchester and 
as you can see, there's my um, email address on the slide. So if you want to get in touch, please do. So thank you for listening today and goodbye. That concludes the presentation section of today's webinar. A huge thank you to our speakers today, Andy, Scott and Julie for their presentations. And of course, to you all for joining us in the webinar and braving the heat on what is maybe the hottest day of the year, depending on where you're based so far. I'm pleased to say we are joined by Andy and Julie, who will be happy to answer any of, any of your questions. So if you have any, please feel free to enter them via the chat function that's on Microsoft Teams. Hopefully at the top of your toolbar, you should be able to see it there. Um, I can see Andy and Julie should be able to enable your mics now. Um, at the start of this webinar, I asked a quick question to people about how they are using um, um, route planning software and things for larger vehicles like um, trucks and buses and stuff where that's necessary. Um, I thought we'd hopefully get a chat through some of the problems that may emerge if you fail to do so. Um, Andy, let's say if a fleet is operating of you know larger vehicles like trucks and lorries and buses and isn't using this sort of program to plan their routes out effectively, what sort of problems do you think they might run into? Um, can you hear me okay? Because I've yes. been having some technological problems today. Um, yes, so, I can hear you just fine. Uh, um, I, well, I guess a, a, lot of the, a lot of those organisations will be already, and uh, um, and we talked about buses, and they, they will probably have their routes optimised anyway, based on the um, on the passenger pickup sort of issues. Um, but if if they're not, then effectively they they don't know um, where their where their vehicles are, or um, they haven't given any any thought to, to some of the issues, and they haven't optimised their their route planning. And ultimately, if they're, if their if their route planning and scheduling isn't optimised, that's a, also a financial issue as well as the potentially putting those vehicles in uh, in areas where there's lots of vulnerable road users when perhaps they they don't need to. So, so yeah, there is a, there is opportunities, but as I said, most organisations operating those sorts of vehicles will have already invested in that sort of technology from a from a business perspective, not from a safety perspective. Fantastic. Well, that is quite great to hear. Um, in that case, Julie, we've got a question for you in the chat here. Um, apologies if I missed this, but is there a criteria that businesses need to meet to use your course? Hi there. Thank you very much. Yes, that's a good question. Um, yes, um, basically it's for people that live and work in Greater Manchester. Um, uh, or companies that are based in Greater Manchester or on the outer edge, you know, sometimes, you know, companies are based, um, say, for example, where I live, I live in Glossop, which is not in Greater Manchester, but is on the very edge of Greater Manchester. So anybody in um, that has a business there could, um, could have their drivers attend the course. So it's it's basically people who live in the area or drive frequently through the area. So we want to try and get, you know, get it to as many people as possible. But obviously, if you're based in Portsmouth, um, then or somewhere like that, then no, it would not be for for anyone like that. But if you're based in the in the general area, then yes. That's great. Thanks, Julie. Um, on a side note, then, are you aware of similar courses operating elsewhere in the country that uh, obviously, this is UK specific, but that other people might be able to look into if they're not eligible for the Transport for Greater Manchester one. Yes, so there are other organisations that run these frequently. Um, I can't pinpoint any specific ones because they're all different in different areas. I don't really know of a one that runs nationally, as far as I know. Um, but you can look up, I think, on the FORS website, perhaps you'll be able to look up there. Maybe they'll be able to tell you um, where there are um, courses available. But yes, I think if you do you know, Google it, then there is there are various organisations that do run courses across the country. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Andy, I was hoping to ask you a question about um, using technologies to facilitate better protection of vulnerable road users as well. Um, what are the key what things in this area that fleets should be aware of or potentially looking into if there's anything developing in that regard? Uh, well, okay. it, it depends on the sorts of vehicles that, that, that are being operated. So there's, um, uh, there's a lot of work being done about sort of uh, the vision standards. So we heard from the first speaker about the, 
um, truck drivers not having particularly good visibility, where there's there's a lot of work in cab design uh, and mirrors and and, uh, and technology, camera technology that will help the driver um, see in those blind spots. So, uh, and, and I think some some organisations are starting to to sort of mandate that. So maybe maybe construction projects in London, for example, they would probably require some of those standards on on larger vehicles going to and from their sites. Uh, when it comes to smaller vehicles, so vans and, and cars, uh, it's, this is really a development of the, the what, with what started with autonomous emergency braking, which which started off really just looking at, uh, at stationary vehicles or slow moving vehicles up ahead on the road. But now that same technology is being expanded to include um, looking for uh, cyclists uh, and looking for people who are uh, crossing or about to cross the road that can then operate those emergency brakes as well. Um, there's rearward um, systems as well so that if you're reversing out of a, of a parking space, now best practice is always to reverse into a parking space, but if for whatever reason you're reversing out of a parking space um, then there's um, technology that should be able to pick up um, uh, a, a cyclist or, or, or uh, indeed a, a, any other vehicle that you haven't seen uh, and apply the brakes so that you, you don't reverse into them. So I think those are the main two technologies, but the, the, the technology landscape is changing fast yeah, as, the, as, the, as there's a lot of work going on into the development of the fully autonomous vehicle, um, then there's going to be a load more um, systems that are available and who knows what they're going to be capable of uh, of doing, um, but, but until we do get to fully autonomous driving, I think it's important to stress that the re ultimate responsibility is with the driver. The technology is a backup. It's a, it's a backup in case the driver hasn't spotted that cyclist, hasn't spotted that pedestrian about to cross. Um, uh, and hopefully the driver should be tra traveling at an appropriate speed for the environment that they're driving in and be fully concentrating so that they are spotting those, those hazards. But the technology is there as a backstop. Brilliant, thank you very much. It doesn't look like we have any further questions today. I think it's quite understandable given that most people sit presumably, hopefully sat somewhere inside with um, getting out of the heat. Um, but no, thank you all for your time again today and for attending this webinar. If you'd like to view it again in the coming weeks, we will be uploading it to our Global Fleet Champions website and again to the Break Charity YouTube page. Um, We'll also be summarising the key discussion points from today into a fact sheet for fleet managers and driver trainers that you can download off the Global Fleet Champions website in the next few months. If you'd like to talk further about any of the things we've spoken about today, you can do so on the Global Fleet Champions LinkedIn page or on our Twitter. We're all on there and you can view our upcoming programme of events on the Global Fleet Champions website. Um, that's everything I, we have for today, so thank you very much for your time. Well, we now conclude. Bye.